Welcome back, everyone, to the Disaster Tough Podcast, where we share insights into the big plays and right calls of leadership. We dive deep into the stories, lessons learned, and ideas that will help you in the field. Let's go. Welcome back to the Disaster Tough Podcast. I'm your host, John Scardina. I am so excited for this episode. Chris Godley is the Director of Emergency Management at Stanford University. He has a wealth of knowledge and experience. He's in the National Guard. He's been an emergency manager. He's been a ton of responses. And now he's the director of the university. And so he's going to talk about lots of different things, lots of different perspectives. But I just want to call out for for everybody. You don't know who you don't know. And it's really funny because I talked to Chris uh, maybe a few months ago with Patrick McGinn, who's been on this podcast, who was former Salvation Army, who was former National IMAT with me who's done a lot of uh, great things in the field. And while talking to Chris, we realized that we were all in different disasters or same disasters uh, doing different roles. So we never crossed paths, which was mind boggling to me because I'm pretty good at meeting a ton of different people, but it just shows that there's so many people involved in a response who have different roles and responsibilities and criteria. And yet we have to get the job done. Disasters are always complex. There's always moving parts. What's most important is that whatever mission set you're given, you do that very well and you have all the training and experience needed to do the job. At the same time, as you continue to meet new people, it just shows that you can learn from them and their perspectives and their needs. And you might not even know that you're at the same event at the same time. So it is a great honor and a huge privilege to have Chris on the show. Let me bring him onto the stage. Chris, thank you for joining me here. Absolutely. Great to be here. So much, Sean. Thanks so much. I'm glad that there's not a wildfire burning in your neck of the woods or for either of us right now, which is very good. It's a pretty rare day, I got to tell you. I've had quite a run over the last five, six years, so it's nice. So I was at, um, let's see, Hurricane Harvey, (laughs) and I got a call, um, or not a call, I got, um, after about six weeks, I got rotation to go home for a week to spend with my wife. Shout out to Aaron. And um, when I was home, we thought it'd be fun to go to Stanford University and walk around the area. It's a, it's a gorgeous area. And while we were walking around, I could smell smoke. Oh, well, actually, not while we were walking. On the drive down, I could smell smoke. And I was like, gosh, dang it. Rodney Melsick, my planning section chief, he's going to call me and tell me to report to Cal OES. And while we were walking around Stanford, sure enough, Rodney calls from Texas and said, hey, there's uh, wildfires in uh, Northern California. I need you to report to Cal OES. So my one week off turned into four <laughs> weeks at Cal OES, and then I uh, went back to Harvey. Um, but that's like my experience with Stanford. It's a gorgeous area. I rem- remember it as being like this time where I got called into Cal OES and got to use drones and wildfires and that kind of thing. Um, but there's a stored career there. Mm-hmm. However, uh, with that kind of my own frame of reference can you for everybody else's situational awareness kind of tell them your um, kind of to be honest pretty incredible work history and then what's your scope now at stanford so sure real briefly just an emergency manager and local government in the san francisco bay area for about 30 years sonoma county and marin county which are north of san francisco then also the city of San Jose, because I wanted to try my hand at the big city game. And then I uh, went into private consulting, a uh, national team, that kind of stuff for about five years. Uh, but to echo your story, John, real briefly in 2017, I was, uh, I didn't want to go to Texas for Harvey. I said, I'll go to Florida and I'll run the back office for this company. And I'm sitting there happy. And then Irma comes in and just hammers us. So I spend my next four weeks doing damage assessment and debris management work. I fly home because I'm exhausted. I'm done, you know, and I've got to rest up because I got to do a conference presentation. So I stay home the extra night instead of going to the conference. That's the night we caught fire in Santa Rosa when the all, we lost 5,300 structures. I ran out the middle of the street at 1 a.m. took one of the first pictures of the fire and there was fire literally on both sides of us. So we had to evacuate the dog and the family and I went to the city's emergency operations center and uh, that launched me back into the public sector, essentially. After about another 10 months of consulting for the local governments, I went back to public sector for Sonoma County to rebuild their program, their emergency management program, 
following the 2017 fires. And then we had a lot of excitement while I was there as well. So lots of response. Maybe I've had about 30 or 40 disasters and maybe 20 of them are federal. Yeah. The L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio solves problems and is specifically designed for emergency services. How do we know? We field tested it with medical, urban search and rescue, and collapsed and confined structures. This radio is amazingly tough. Check out the L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio at L3Harris.com right now. How do you spell Doberman Emergency Management? EOP, OEP, HVA, HMP, Thyra, TTX, Drone, PDA. Whenever you need an expert, Doberman Emergency Management field experts are there for support. Contact an expert at DobermanEMG.com today. First responders, this is for you. From law enforcement to emergency managers, it's time for emergency services professionals to overcome communications issues. The Readiness Lab, in partnership with L3 Harris Technologies, is pleased to announce a free Next Level Emergency Services training and exercise workshop. In the morning, we'll hear from four field experts. Pete Gaynor, former acting secretary, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Jake Shores, quality control expert, GMR, reviewing mass casualty incidents, Anthony Escoto, communications expert, enhancing multi-agency communications during complex coordinated response operations, Barry Moss, public safety expert, the London Olympic success, afternoon interactive exercise, mass casualty response at the parade, stressing communications, gear provided by L3 Harris, and finish strong with our first responder networking event. This is a community experience. Registration is free and open to all emergency services professionals. Sign up now for the July 23rd workshop in Vancouver, Washington. We'll see you there. The Santa Rosa, like specifically Coffee Park. Mm -hmm. I I had been to what I'd thought a lot of different disasters before then. And honestly, a lot of them were tornadoes and hurricanes. Um, a couple active shooters and that kind of thing. I had never seen anything like that before. It was it was like a nuke had gone off. I'd never seen engines melted into the ground before. I it was it was like it was like um gosh, what is that famous painting where the clock is melting over the tree? Salvador Dali, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um mind boggling. And uh what was shocking to me, and maybe you can shed, shed some more light on this. I went to, back to Coffee Park a couple years later, and it was rebuilt, completely rebuilt. And I asked um, some of the locals there who were walking around, I'm like, hey, I'm not seeing any like commercial sprinklers on tops of the roofs here. And they're like, oh, yeah, our HOA voted not to add them back on hmm. or not to add them on. But the one house, I have a picture of it. The one house left standing was somebody who had taken their hose and just happened to throw it onto the roof and kept their, their roof on their house. Hmm. And I was like, you had an example and all your homes built down and, and burned down. And the response I got was, well, what are the chances of it happening again? <laughs> yes, it's exactly true. No, it's funny because that same fire in 2017 was experienced in 1954 called the Hanley fire, except that fire took almost four days to cover the same distance that the 2017 fire covered in four hours. And it's really the new, extraordinarily dynamic nature of these wildfires, the winds, especially uh, in the last five, six years that have really been the story. It's what we saw in Maui, in paradise. It's literally the wind running in at 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. I mean, our humidity has dropped to three and 4%. So whatever you put in front of a, a flame front with, or even an ember cast front with 3% humidity and 50 mile an hour winds, it's going to burn. So there's just no way around it. So it could happen again and they should have commercial sprinklers on top of the roofs. It's, it's, it's a big part of the whole conversation. It's like, okay, who's going to pay for all this? If we rebuild, we've got code, the new code you have to meet. But what we're really talking about now is defending against fire that is so dynamic that maybe you're going to have to do more than what code requires. And that in California, they're really wrestling with this idea of maybe we don't, we're, we can't fight the fire only in the forest. We have to fight the fire at the house. And what that means is home hardening. And that means you may have to give up the wood deck. You're going to have to put the really tight mesh screening around the house that might require you to put some, you know, air blowers underneath the house to keep it dry. It's going to take more extraordinary structural work to keep these homes and businesses safe than what we'd seen in the past. 
Well, that's a pretty big shout out to um, tell us how to make a better podcast. Um, George Siegel has a, like a pretty cool film about um, basically Hurricane Michael and hardening homes. And um, basically the entire thing is a call out of building codes are not designed to help protect people and um, how that changes things. But going over to kind of fast forward to the Stanford world, mm-hmm. you, you moved on to that. Stanford has a pretty robust uh, program as far as I understand. And your your aspect is one slice of that. You know, as the director, what what is your area of focus? Is it all things emergency management or is it kind of more um, honed into one or two things or a few things? It's all things. And what's really interesting, one of the reasons I came here is because Stanford, everyone thinks of it, oh, it's a school and they have kids and classes. and But just to run it down for you, Stanford has only 7,500 undergraduate students. So it's really relatively small in that population. But it's got 8,500 graduate students. So different body than most universities. But still, come on, Chris, that's only 15,000 people. I and mean, come on, how exciting is that, right? Well, it's got 18,000 staff. And you're like, wait a minute, how come it's got more staff than students? And that's because Stanford is more than university. It's a monster research program. I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars annually that go into developing not only basic science, but in Stanford's case, a real focus on applied science. How do we roll this out now? Biotech, tech like AI is coming out. And so there's a big investment in this machine that is Stanford in terms of being a thought leader and also running operations here and campus at remote campuses and, and across the world. And so it's a it's a big environment, a big community if you would. And so for that, we're addressing both traditional emergency management, planning, training, exercising, but also more and more what we call mission continuity instead of business continuity, we use the term mission continuity. And that's increasingly important. As, as we'll talk about it here, the world that we work in now is a little more challenging than it was five or 10 years ago. So, okay, that begs like a story and two questions. Mm-hmm. So I worked at the National Cancer Institute. We started their EM program there. It was a team of five. And uh, I had quite the education. It was like my first real DC job. And I learned a lot about negative AD freezers and irreplaceable research. But one of the things I was not expecting was the emotional toll of the researchers. If the problem set that they started off 30 years prior, they realized there was a mistake. And we had, I'm going to make sure I say this correctly. We had incidents that we had to make sure the researchers didn't feel like they had wasted an entire career on a single mistake. And the amount of money and time and effort that went into it. And so the, it became exponentially complex because you can't lose the research no matter what. But the researchers themselves actually became um, an area of focus for us to make sure that um, everything was running smoothly. I don't know if you deal with that too much on, on your end or not. Um, but people forget, like, they think emergency management, like public safety stuff. There's a whole other world of, and I, I'm, I, I like how you're calling it mission continuity. I'm hyper curious about that. But there's a whole other world that they don't realize that like lives matter, um, intelligence matters, everything that hinges off of what's being done at this organization. You can't just have like the building standing. You have to make sure you don't lose all the other components, right? right. I don't know if you deal with that or too much or not. No, it's a great point. Um, and I do because... We've got grad students that have invested their entire degree set or 10 years of research. You know, if you lose a batch of mice, it puts them back forever. And in Stanford, the goal is to be the cutting edge, to be the first one out there. There's significant investment in that uh, personally, financially. Um, But your question really begs and opens up the point that I mean, I'm former National Guard. I come out of the whole paramilitary model, ICS, great stuff. But emergency management is transforming and continues to evolve to not just be public safety, not just be an application of logistics and process and policy. We're growing more and more into, if you would, the executive function of the organizations we support. 
we're seeing more and more focus now on what I call the soft side of emergency management. That is, how do we address those qualitative issues, the quality of yeah. life, the behavioral health components that need to be so important as part of all of our response? I'll just share, I got my degree in psychology from UCLA, and I get out of school, and I'm like, okay, great. What's this degree worth? A bachelor's in psychology is completely useless, okay? You're just dangerous. That's all you are. You can't really apply it very well without going on. But as an emergency manager, having come in through the National Guard, over the decades, I've seen more and more of my psychology degree moving up in terms of how I think about we designing our plans and our processes and how we address the needs of the community that have been impacted by these events. Empowerment, the ability to give people the idea that they can survive these events, that they're not just victims, that they have some agency. How do we address children, you know, really profoundly, not just the immediate emotional trauma, but that long-term behavioral health that comes out. So your question begs a lot, but I really am encouraged to see more and more emergency management embracing that larger mission, even if it's not quite as sexy as hardware and radios and all that kind of stuff. I, I'm really encouraged by that. Uh, well, sexy or not, I think it's pretty cool to help people actually overcome their situation. And people are naturally much more resilient than we give them credit for. Mm -hmm. I have seen people lose literally everything, family members and things and have nothing and somehow are able to get up and keep moving. And it is, I, I want to say inspiring because that's, it's, it's, it reminds me. Of, of the res resilient spirit. However, the long-term impacts of disaster are real. PTSD is definitely real. And, um, you know, for the sake of the listener who's kind of curious about this topic, a good couple places that I would start, and maybe Chris can give some additional resources, but I would start with uh, looking at Social Vulnerability and Disaster. It's a great book to look at, like, the psychology of disaster and the anthropology of disaster. Mm -hmm. And then the other one that I, I, I mentioned, I think, fairly often on the show is... Um, the, what researchers did in, uh, in Sendai, Japan, after the earthquake, by giving them a regimented meals uh, and workout exercises and things to do, the communities who did that were able to overcome a lot of the emotional toll so much faster than other communities by, by putting in some of those, I'm going to trick my body that I'm doing well, therefore I'm doing well um, mm -hmm. ideas. So I don't know, do you have additional resources maybe you could share with other people? I was just trying to think off the top of my head, not by resource or by book, but I would encourage people to take a good look at programs that work in post-disaster recovery. Uh, like After the Wildfire is a phenomenal program. If you have a community that's threatened by or has been hit by wildfire, they're phenomenal because they come in and they identify and they address those issues head on. Where government is an unwieldy tool, not very efficient in the nonprofits that might come in are very focused on specific, you know, functions of deliverables. Uh, the after the fire folks come in and they talk about community and they talk about engagement and building partnership back. And that's how people heal, not just recover, but to actually heal and, and come out, if not healthier, but at least maybe perhaps even stronger. Um, it's very encouraging to see that come up. Uh, Americans versus what's gone on in Japan, we tend to go it along. We're kind of stoic. We hardly know our neighbors. We're not very socially oriented all the time. And so when something bad does happen, we often do feel alone. Uh, and so it's nice to see people coming together and a greater willingness to come together after these events. Yeah. And on, on the reverse of that, I don't think people realize the, the trauma and the toll it can take on people by not being aware of those things. You know, how many times have responders gone out there and implemented you know their policy their thing you know we just got to move forward because of the disaster we had to roll and you're just you're just hurting people left and right unintentionally and I'm, I'm not trying to call out to responders but i'm just trying to help people remind and this is a great call out from you as well like just be cognizant of those things and it, a little bit of learning can go a long way to taking care of people on, on an other angle of this, here's the second question that I was kind of thinking of before, because I had to deal with a million PhDs who uh, were doctors and cared about their research more than anything else. 
And I went in there as a 20 something and I said, Hey, emergency management is important. We got to do these fire drills and whatever. And I had to really learn to navigate and get people on my side. I'm sure Stanford has your back. It sounds like you match very well with that community. You know, you're cutting edge yourself. However, for somebody who's getting into that kind of that different world where people, the stakeholders have different, very different priorities and needs, how have you navigated this and what's some kind of the advice that you could give to other people? Well, always go on with humility. You may be an expert. You may have experience. You may have seen the elephant, as it were. But your first job in preparing and providing product information, a presentation, is to know your audience. Who are they really? What are their issues? Why are you there? Did they invite you in? Are you forcing your way in? What experiences they had? What's that, If like you just highlighted, what's that unspoken trauma that may be at the root of all this? You've got to dig a little bit before you can be useful to anybody. And if you come in with humility and with that servant leadership attitude, you'll do okay. You're not going to be perfect. You're not going to make every single person happy. But if you can meet people where they are where they are, and speak their lingo, you're going to be so much more successful. Where are some of the areas that you have found the most success in Stanford? Uh, so it would be interesting in that most people would understand silos with an organization, right? This department at division. Well, Stanford is profoundly and proudly decentralized. It's actually one of the secrets to success is to basically empower each of the schools, like School of Medicine or Engineering, that they can make decisions that are not going to have to go before every, every decision does not have to go before the university cabinet or board. That if school engineering wants to turn left on Tuesday, on Wednesday, they're turning left. Okay, they can make this stuff happen. That dynamic capability allows Stanford to stay at that leading edge of whatever research, technology, science they're working on. What that does, though, is, of course, it creates intense and very unique organizational challenges if you're looking to unify suddenly in a crisis across the university because the schools may not work together on a day-to-day -day basis, but now at 3 a.m., hey, suddenly we have to do that. And so I think my bigger successes were coming in the whole year I've been here is really highlighting, you know, here's the value add. Your school, you're operating in it. I can bring you product like Active Threat. And I can say, here's where it's of value to you. We'll take on these roles. This is still your autonomy in terms of this event. But people then can see that common good. Or power outages, to your point about it impacting research, that's almost as bad as the earthquake, okay, <laughs> losing power. So, okay, great. How do we actually settle and move through the noise and the uncertainty that a power edge might bring and bring clarity, especially in terms of communication. What's exactly going on? How do we communicate with staff and students? If So by demonstrating that value, that's been a success. So people now see it. Uh, we just opened our new emergency operations center uh, a little over a week ago on Thursday, and we activated it on Wednesday. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, congratulations yeah. and hilarious. Yeah. So, you know, oh, you're always busy. Um, what are the things that if you're talking about successes and, and the silo thing I get, uh, I worked at Apple for a while in business intelligence and talk about a company that's historically siloed. So maybe, uh, either Apple or Stanford told somebody else that that was a good idea. Cause that's, it's all about being siloed. <laughs> However, I also felt some of the big wins were just trying to show while business function can remain separate, it's incredibly important that you don't lose your own capability by not being able to talk mm -hmm. and um, trying to work through some of those wins. I found a majority of the time, whether it was Apple or NCI or anywhere else, that my biggest wins were trying to figure out people as a person rather than like talking about my job. Mm -hmm. and, like if I started talking about the job, they would glaze over. But as soon as I started uh, finding that connection of like, Oh, your kids in soccer, my kids in soccer kind of thing. That is when, I think that the door would open up when they realize you're a little more human than, you know, maybe like, you know, static machine or whatever. So um, there's that component. But Stanford's unique in, in many areas. You just called out some of those areas. Where it's located is unique. 
um, not only with uh, in the you know in that uh, region, but you know you have to deal with PSPS that you're calling out. You have to deal with potential wildfire threat. You have to deal with earthquake threat. When you're putting together a hazard vulnerability assessment and you're putting together your EOC and the things that you have to worry about, what is some advice that you can give to somebody who's listening in? Of okay, I'm also in an environment where I have to deal with lots of different simultaneous potential threats. Resources are finite, and you can't get everything moving at the same time. You've been at Stanford for a year. How do you how do you organize your resources? So, well, it comes down now. You're talking politics. I know you're thinking, oh, no, no, this is emergency management. You have a prioritized list. You do a risk analysis. You come up with the numbers. You get the maps out. Absolutely, you can do that. That's the the if you would the schoolhouse solution. What I'm going to suggest is that you come and you look at that organization that you're supporting or the community that you're protecting. What are the values that they have? What's that culture like? And for me, it's going to come in and say, "Hey, look, I've got you know 47 things that can go wrong on Tuesday. Great, Chris, go away, please. I don't want to hear about those. But why am I here? Why was this position created? Or what's the new movement? What's where are my uh, partners in crime, as I call them? Who's also got religion here? Who is it? The earthquake folks that are you know, over in engineering that are paranoid about this, or is there discussion and uh, real interest in leadership? For me, you need to talk to your risk manager right away. Your risk managers, that poor slob or two or four folks that are trying to track everything, make sure we're covered financially, if not operationally. And they've got a sense of what of concern to not only them, but to leadership. They can be a tremendous ally. For us, the big hazard, if you would, natural hazard is earthquake, of course. Well, that just so happens to be a significant number one priority for our risk management. As emergency managers, just a by way example, we don't have a lot of authority. Can't tell a lot of people what to do. Sorry, folks. I know it says director on the business card. That's not going to get you anywhere. But instead, if your risk manager builds earthquake and earthquake preparedness into their annual audit, oh, game on. Because now you've got a whole machine that can help you identify and quantify earthquake preparedness, something you couldn't take on by yourself. Learning how to play the game a little bit um, can go a long way. I, feel, I do feel bad for those that I've met in the field who I know are so intelligent and tactically minded and can put all the puzzle pieces together but man they, if they're abrasive and they, they wonder why they can't get things done it, it is it is like a, you know you you want to pull them aside and be like hey if, if you learn to smile a little bit you learn to you know cool you'd actually get your your job done and, and it's helpful to hear somebody like you who's very successful telling people that on the show because i think sometimes ambition can get above the mission mm -hmm. and just remembering to, you have to play the game a little bit and to bide your time and to work with people and find the wins is, is a huge success. And, and I would jump in and say, you know, cause it's a dirty word politics or play the game, or you feel like, Oh no, this is some kind of petty kind of activity that humans engage with on meaningless subjects. But what I'm going to suggest to you, coming out of this, there's greater and more research coming out that shows how all of us, especially in emergency management, for if we're not in a position of, or we don't have positional authority, we may have subject matter or knowledge authority. That may not always carry the day, but that personal influence, just like you talked about, John, with being able to engage somebody one-on-one, -on -one, that will carry the day. I'll, I'll share with you uh, one of the benefits coming to Stanford was so that I could grow personally, that I could look ahead and see what are the hazards we're going to face in the next 20 years, but also how am I going to improve as an individual? And to that end, I'm allowed to audit courses at Stanford. So I literally get to go to class here at Stanford. So one of the last classes I took was at the Graduate School of Business, Stanford Graduate School of Business, pretty decent uh, program they've got going here. And the class was spontaneous management. And essentially, they're looking at their graduate students to say, how do we give you those interpersonal skills, the soft skills that are going to make you effective, that you can walk into a room, you can engage with people meaningfully, 
that you can become an influencer indirectly, possibly. And that was one of the best classes I've ever taken. And it's it's going to sound silly here to folks that are military, fire, law, but this class was based in large part on improv. Now, you may recognize that term from improv comedy, and certainly it can be funny when people have to improvise. But for me as an emergency manager, that's what we do in response is we constantly have to improvise our response strategies, our relationships, the people that we work with. But doing so one-on-one, it really helps me move into a room now with greater confidence and being more effective what I need to do as an emergency manager. So I, I, I would encourage folks to not just get the book learning done, not just get the ICS certs and all the hard stuff. Invest in yourself on those soft skills. Uh, my, my greatest recommendation now when I get people coming to me, I say, go join an improv troupe, take an improv class. Because I don't necessarily need an emergency manager that knows everything. What I need on my team is an emergency manager that can make things happen, like they influence the organization. So that's a better skill for me than ICS 10,000. So. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm I'm literally going to blacklist this episode from Zach Borst listening in. Yeah. He's my number two in the company, and he's on EM Weekly, and he was a stand-up comedian for a year and a half. <laughs> and when he tells people, when people go to him and say, "Why you're so good at briefing? Why are you so influential?" and he always he always says soft skills. And the number one thing he tells them to do after that, take an improv class. There you go. Hey. And I'm like, oh, no. Every time he says that, I'm like, come on. But it's true. Like, you got to be able to communicate with people and to, to work through that and work through difficult problems mm-hmm. while not losing your head. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's a big shout out to you and to Zach. Um, you know, Zach's my really my, my right-hand man on everything. And I trust him and I trust you. So now you got the testimony of two witnesses. So maybe I'll take an improv class. But um, pretty great stuff. Chris, uh, you mentioned, and I, I'm looking at the time here, and I don't want to um, overdo the time with you, and I, I really appreciate the time we have. But in the beginning, you mentioned mission continuity versus business continuity. As you're, you've already had like several mic drop moments, to be honest. If you could give us um, kind of the difference in your mindset of what those two things are and, and how they relate, that'd be really great. So it's really just a question of who your community is. And in here at Stanford, We've got, a, kind of got three communities. We have academic. These are folks that teach kids, the students, I should say, here at the university. Traditional organization, traditional approach, academic, great. We also have research. Again, multi-billion dollar program set, high security, very cutting edge stuff, very big investments, a lot of stress and time compression, plus the direct, literally across the street linkages uh, with Silicon Valley startups. I mean, they're directly intertwined. And the third one is, of course, we have to run this whole machine. So for those familiar with trying to run an organization with a $9 billion budget, business continuity comes into play, especially when you've got these tight leakages like power outages causing profound disruption. And so when we were looking at increasing the capacity of the university in its business continuity, we took a hard look at why is this not being widely adopted? Okay, great. The business folks are totally okay with that term. Totally get it. ISO, blah, blah, blah. I get my cert. They're great. But academic and research are like, oh, no, 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 no. We're not business. That's a dirty word. No, no, we're academic. No, we're research. And so by focusing on, okay, then what is it that you do? What is it that you want to protect? What is it that you have to be capable of making sure it doesn't fall down? They're like, they kept saying mission and mission and mission. This is what we do. We said, then that's the term we're going to go with. We're seeing other universities adopt that term, so we're not the first ones to use it. But by broadening and softening that term away from just business functions, we can now embrace continuity for research laboratories and continuity for academic programs like what if you can't hold finals? What's plan B for that? They totally understand that. Are you? Do you consider yourself a wordsmith? A bit. I've done a bit of work. Yeah, a little reading and writing. Sure, it's it's the best way to communicate sometimes. You and Rodney uh, Melsick, um, a guy I look up to as an emergency planner a lot, are definitely wordsmiths, and it's carried over into our business. Mm-hmm. On the professional services side, I have blacklisted two words. 
if anybody uses these two words in my company, I get actually mad. Um, and it's not because the words themselves are wrong, but it's because the connotation to the people that we work with, mm. they cannot use the word preparedness because they think doomsday preppy, 72 hour kits, not interactive. And so instead of saying preparedness, we say readiness. You know, like, how do you become ready? What is, what is your readiness posture look like? And that feels more interactive and it feels, uh, you know, more common for them that they want to deal with because my stakeholders are not typically emergency managers. Always there, there are other people outside of that scope. The other word that I can't, I, I, that we will never use is consultant because <laughs> there's so many consultants in emergency management that have never actually done the job. And every single person who I've hired has actually done the job. We, we know what it's like. So instead of saying consultant, again, it's a wordplay thing, but we just say support. We're an emergency management support group. We want to support somebody else's EOC. We want to support somebody else's program. We are never their consultant. And, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things happening like that, whether I'm in the private side or the public side, where we really need to remind ourselves the words that we're using and the connotation it is providing to other people mitigation resiliency these kind of words are sometimes buzzwords but i don't think you know it's like the what is that uh movie uh you keep using that word but i don't think you know what that word really means, really means. <laughs> yeah. yeah because when somebody hears mitigation they're thinking of something before the disaster but everybody uses it after and resiliency people don't want to have to bounce back Mm -hmm. My school administrators, the people that I work with, they don't want to have to be resilient, right? And resiliency is important, but using d words that help them understand, you know, the phase that they're in, I, I think it's incredibly wise that you are able to be able to see that very quickly. And it's a great call out. It's a, probably the, the great way to end the show. Chris, if you're going to give any advice to the field of emergency managers, what would be your, your final thoughts to them? Professional development don't just take subject matter expertise courses. You're going to have to invest in yourself. And it's not selfish. And that's a hard thing for me to get over. It took me years to say, you know, I should learn how to write better. I should learn how to use PowerPoint for real. Okay, please, everybody, I beg you. Okay. I mean, if you're going to be good at your job, but you cannot engage and you cannot communicate well, it really doesn't matter what you got upstairs if you can't get it out there and you can't use it to really empower people to do more to pr protect themselves. I, I I would step back a little bit from the, the hunt for certificates and do a little more work on myself. I think that would be my best recommendation. Uh, mic drop. I, I think that's like my seventh mic drop that I counted from you uh, on this episode. I have been really excited to talk to you, not only because we kind of cross paths, uh, but... You're obviously a thinker. There, I, I enjoy listening and learning from other people that are, are starting to figure things out, not just the remote, okay, template, follow the ICS form, but actually looking at the greater scope. And I really do hope as the audience has been looking through, especially if they want to get better at their field, they look at themselves and how they can improve, but they also break out of the template mindset and start saying what is actually effective and uh, so, Chris, again, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast and talk to me in the audience. It was great, John. Uh, hope we never cross paths during an actual event again, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, uh, <laughs> what a great way to end so, Okay, so everybody, if you got something out of this podcast, which you should have, there's lots of really great nuggets here, working on the soft skills, working on yourself as a professional, not just the profession, uh, looking outside the box, getting better using terminology that makes sense for your stakeholders. There's a whole lot of really great information here. If you got something out of this podcast, which you should have, you got to give us a like and subscribe. We say that every time. But also, if something, you figured out something, an outside-of-the-box idea that is working for you, share it on social media. If you have a question or a comment for Chris, we you know send us an email, a contact at the Readiness Lab, and we can be happy to pass it on. And with that, we'll see you for the next one. Peace. Peace.